please welcome to the stage Eddie Q and Dylan Byers. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming Hi. out. Uh, we're off the record. That's always, in today's world, you're always off the record, Great. right? <laughs> so uh, a week ago today, I launched a new newsletter at CNN called Pacific. And the focus of it is the West Coast tech and innovation economy. And when you launch a newsletter, you really think about your target audience. You think about who the smartest people in that world are, what they care about, and what they want to read. And my target, there's no one who more fits the bill for my target audience than Eddie Q, because he is at the intersection of innovations in technology, innovations in media. He flies on a near weekly basis, I would say, between the Bay Area and Los Angeles. Uh, and he's thinking a lot about this sort of big picture future of where we're going. And you just broke some news. We did. <laughs> it's a great, great, great day for us. Uh, we announced that uh, we did an acquisition this morning uh, of Texture. Uh, Texture is an app that has uh, been in the uh, iOS store. It's uh, beloved by our uh, iPad users because you get access to uh, all of the great magazines from Condé Nast, from uh, Time, Meredith, Hearst. Um, and uh, we just uh, did an acquisition. So are you shocked that acquiring publishers that this news didn't break earlier? It feels to me like <laughs> nobody leaks more Well, this, this, this is one where uh, it was about them, so maybe that had something to do with it. So, <laughs> so okay, so how does acquiring Texture advance the, the grand strategy of Apple News? Well, I, th I think that there are a few things that we always cared about in Apple News. Um, First of all, we wanted to, to bring great articles um, from trusted sources um, in a beautiful layout. And when you look, that's, that was the, the premise of Apple News that we, we started with, which was if you do that, then lots of customers will use it and will love it. And uh, obviously, Texture, with the brands that I just told you about, they have magazines from you know, Esquire to Vanity Fair to Time, to Sports Illustrated, uh, some of the best magazines in the world. So they have some incredible content, and content that takes a long time to create. Um, so they're in-depth articles, and, and so we're really excited about bringing that into Apple News to augment all of the, uh, the content that we have now from thousands of publishers. But the key to uh, ours is about curation. Um, we want the best articles. Um, we want them to look amazing. Uh, and we want them to be from trusted sources so that we don't have a lot of the issues that have been going around uh, in the marketplace. So there, there have been a lot of issues going around about trust in media. Usually when people talk about who owns the media right now, people talk about Facebook and Google just because their share of the advertising revenue is so high. Obviously, Facebook seems to be retreating from the news space or at least sort of recalibrating what they're doing. Do you believe that Apple News can sort of step in and become the top news or the dominant news well, player in the digital space? Look, today for um, some of the publishers that we have, including some very large ones like CNN, uh, we already account for 60, 70 percent of the articles that are read uh, across the web and other services. So we've become a, um, a pretty decent sized player in a short amount of time uh, around it. Uh, we also started where user, our customers that we're reading were following about four publishers uh, in, in Apple News a year ago. Today they follow more than 20. Um, so there's been tremendous growth in, in Apple News. And so we just want to continue to accelerate that by bringing things like, uh, things that are startups like the Pacific uh, to things that are so big like, you know, Condé Nast. So the, the question of curation that you talk about, companies like Facebook and Google have been hit hard over the question of their sort of the, the tension between wanting to remain open platforms where anybody can post any sort of news and um, you know, not wanting to limit free speech. Uh, but that's a really tricky bargain. I mean, that's a really tricky game to play. Do you, do you have any thoughts on how Facebook and Google have tackled this news problem? Do you think that they have been uh, robust enough in uh, uh, 
did you buy their open platform argument, or do you think that they needed to be more aggressive in terms of curation? You know, look, it's always hard to sit from the outside to, to talk about others. I, I, I do know that for ourselves, when we've got into this, we think when you have a, a large platform, um, there's a lot of responsibility. And, and we've always taken a great deal of responsibilities for our platforms, starting from iTunes, uh, when we did the music store, to the app store, certainly Apple News, podcasts. And so we had a bunch of rules. We came up with guidelines that had to be followed in order to participate in there. And you know, at times, we got a lot of heat for it. Uh, people weren't happy that we had guidelines. Um, the other part is that nobody is completely free. There's no such thing as free. There's no pornography on any of these sites. So people do draw lines, and you can decide where you want to draw the line. We do think free speech is important, but we don't think white supremacist or hate speech is free speech that's important to be out there. Um, and, We don't True. Think, we, we don't think, for example, you know, we denied bomb-making apps, um, bo you know, apps that were submitted into our store that would, you know, teach you how to make a bomb. We just don't think that's something we want on our platform, and but so we draw we draw those lines. Your line, your the NRA fell on the right side of your line when it came to Apple TV, so their channel is still there, and obviously there was a great deal of pressure on. A, a litany of media companies at, in, in the wake of the horrific school shootings and, and shootings that we've seen. Is there a reason you kept NRA? Yeah, what we do is we, we draw a set of guidelines that are published so everyone in the world can read them. Um, it provides very detailed of, of what are the guidelines that you have to follow. And those guidelines apply whether you're a CNN or whether you're a one-man shop developer. Um, and we follow them across the board. We have a team of people that review every single app um, and when I say a team, it's not just one person. Multiple people review every single app as it goes through to make sure that it follows the guidelines. Um, if it doesn't follow the guidelines, we obviously don't allow it in the store. If it changes as, as it's in the store and it violates our guidelines, we take it out. So when we look at any of these apps, we look and see whether it follows the guidelines. And we do think it's important. Um, we have certainly the, the NRA TV app. We also have uh, pro-gun control apps in our store. It's important for America and, and the world to have debate on certain issues from that standpoint. But if it falls off, I'll give you an example. From day one, we decided that we did not want our app store to be a place that you buy and sell guns. Um, and so we don't allow apps that allow you to buy or sell guns. We don't allow apps that uh, show cruelty uh, to animals. We don't allow violent uh, apps that are showing, uh, doing things to human beings. And so we draw those lines. And then we, like I said, we, we make sure that we review every single app and that it comes in and, and follows our guidelines. And, and again, f free speech is something we stand behind and it is important, but that doesn't mean it's everything. Do you think that other companies like Facebook, Google, or even Reddit have a responsibility to draw clear lines? I think everybody has a responsibility uh, in the world. Uh, so I don't, I don't, certainly that's the way we feel. We, we take a great deal uh, and think a lot about the decisions and, and the guidelines and the principles that we want to run our company in, uh, from things to the environment. Uh, I think in today's world, I think companies have to take responsibility, and, and we're going to step up and do that. So what happens when people start coming to Apple News and there's a perception because you're in California and because of some of the decisions you've made about the more radical forms of conservatism that Apple is a progressive company and they're not a reliable source for news? How do you uh, counterbalance that? Sure. I, I think um, you, you make sure that you provide, again, trusted sources. And so you could... Uh, I've gotten lots of emails that say our Apple News product is too far left, and I've gotten lots of emails that our product is too far right. It depends on which articles people are following and, and which are their sources. Um, and so we do want to provide different viewpoints. One of the things that we uh, wanted to do with Apple News is not just provide the news that you want to read. Um, and one of the reasons we can do that is we're not advertising focused. Mm -hmm. right, so Apple doesn't make any money on advertising through Apple News in reality. It's very small amounts. 
So we're not after trying to get you to keep reading the same thing over and over again to try to give you more ads or any of that standpoint. We wanted to create a little bit of serendipity, a little bit of information so that you could see all of the different things that are out there. And so we try not just to give you the most popular thing for you, um, but some of the articles that you should be reading that are in-depth. And, and we let you decide if you want to follow some of those sources. If you don't, you can eliminate them. But we want that serendipity. I know when I used to read the paper, you'd pick up the paper and you start reading it. You'd always find articles that if you had asked me ahead of time, am I particularly interested in a topic, I would have never identified that topic. Um, and sometimes that's getting lost now because we just want to give you only what you want and the same thing over and over so again. So you're bringing back the newspaper? Not quite, but... Uh, <laughs> An aggregated newspaper. What do you, one that fits like this big <laughs> and it's uh, really... What, what do you read? What, um, like personally, just you? Yeah. Well, you know, there's the personal interest and, in, you know, I start uh, my day uh, by picking up the Apple, not surprise, right, Apple News app. Um, and one of the things that we do is we pick editorially what are the top seven, eight articles for the day uh, that you should be reading in the morning, the top news from that standpoint. And it's, it's covered from a variety of sources. Um, and those sources change all the time. And, and what we're trying to look for is who's really covered it in an in-depth way, more than just giving you the, the, the sort of headline. Or uh, We don't try to do any kind of clickbait on the, on the title of the article or anything like that. Um, and so it's a great way to get up to speed right away. Mm -hmm. And then certainly I, I get email newsletters now as of uh, last week, the Pacific. But, uh, but I, I follow, uh, I'm a big sports person, so I read The Athletic. Uh, which is a local team um, sports thing. I'm also a big car guy, so I read a lot of blogs around cars. Uh, so it's, it's a variety of things, but a lot of it falls right into Apple News because we get it from all the different sources. So is, let's keep talking about acquisitions. The tech track acquisition is a big deal for Apple News. Let's talk about Apple TV and the sort of grand strategy here. You are sitting at the top or near the cop top of a company that has a market value of $910 billion, give or take. I'm sure you have more up-to-date statistics. You could, it seems to me conceivably, buy Netflix. You could even buy Disney if you wanted to. <laughs> Do you want to buy Netflix or Disney? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh... Look, the, the good news is that uh, both Netflix and Disney are, are great partners of ours and uh, have been with us from the, <laughs> from the very beginning. Um, look, generally, um, the history of Apple, we haven't made huge acquisitions. Um, and generally, we haven't done Why? That. Why haven't we? Well, the reason we haven't done that is we, we tried to go, it's the, the old Gretzky quote, you know, skate to where the puck is going, not to where it is. Right. Um, and so if you're trying to go to where it's going, then generally you've got to figure where that, where, where is that and what is it that you want to go build for that. And so when you think of TV today, um, most of us here in the audience and, and, and around the world um, get their TV via satellite and cable predominantly. Uh, Netflix has done very well and others have done. But, but when you look at the number of hours that are being watched, it's coming through that mechanism. If I sat here today and we, I asked people to raise their hands, how many people think that will be true 10 years from now? Um, I think you'd see a lot less hands than the ones that, that are here because you can feel the change, you can see the change, and some of it is because you've got devices with you all the time that you want to be able to watch. Um, you, you know that people today don't want to watch advertising. You know, the, people skip ads all the time. They don't really like ads. Uh, around it. You've got things like setting up a DVR, which is just brain dead and crazy. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the first time we got a, a VHS machine in our house and you had to put the timer and the, set the clock and then it would, the tape would run out and you wouldn't get the last part of the... The same thing happens with a DVR, just a bigger, bigger storage. Why is it that I can't just call things on demand? Mm -hmm. uh, the technology is there. And so we think there's a real change coming in the marketplace as to where people are getting it. And, and one of those places, as you can see, is apps, right? Netflix is, is, is all about an app uh, around it. Uh, another thing that you see is things are much more global. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in Austin today. If I want to watch um, certain things that I pay two to $300 for a service, 
uh, a satellite or cable service. It might be blacked out because I'm in Austin or it might not be available. I mean, I, I pay you know, $9.99 for a streaming service. I get it anywhere I am in the world. Right. Um, so there's just a lot of these things that, that are going to get solved. So you, I, I recognize skating to where the puck is going to be. At the same time, you have made a number of content acquisitions that do feel pretty traditional. I mean, you've got Reese Wither, the Reese Witherspoon Jennifer Aniston project. You have Damien Chazelle. You have a Steven Spielberg documentary. I believe you've got a number of other things that sort of look like the acquisitions that an Amazon or a Netflix or you know whoever might make. So at I, I think Netflix learned at a certain point that you had to go all in on on you know celebrities, actors, actresses that people knew, showrunners that people knew. Netflix just played Ryan Murphy $300 million. Um, there is a feeling that you have to have this huge, enormous tentpole project. Why, why are you doing these sort of like little, staking little claims in the content space? Why not just go big and buy Netflix? Well, we're, we're, we're all in. Um, we're completely all in. Um, there's a difference, though. We're not after quantity. We're after quality. Um, we don't try to sell the most start smartphones in the world. We don't try to sell the most tablets. We try to make the best one, and hopefully the other piece happens. Um, and so when you think of content, um, first of all, and you can see that here in, in, in South by Southwest, um, great storytelling is what's important. Uh, and you get great storytelling from big name people, and you also get it from new and up and comers. Um, but you need to have a great story. I learned that in the, in the early days um, when I, I, I was really, my, my whole background's computers. I got to meet Steve. Steve was running Pixar at the time. And Pixar had done like two or three, four hits in a row. And I said, like, why is Pixar getting, always doing hits, and yet others are not? And it's, and we talked about the fact that it's all about the storytelling. And if the story's not right, they go back and do it again, and they get it right. And so great storytelling is what's important. And so what we hope we're doing is that we hope we bring some amazing, great quality stuff. Um, we'll have a few surprises. We think there's a real advantage in technology. You're, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we talk about like sports and the TV app. We think there, there are ways to leverage technology to make the viewing experience uh, even better. But in terms of premium content, do you need to have if I look at every other company in this space, the logic suggests that you need to have a big tentpole project. So HBO is chasing its Game of Thrones spin-offs to try and maintain what it's doing. Amazon spent $250, $270 million just on the rights to Lord of the Rings. I think Netflix has The Witcher uh, that it's working on. Um, that there are, there's this sort of sense that in order to be dominant in this space, you have to make a really big investment and start spending you know, 10 to $15 million per episode on some grand fantasy project. Do you guys... Again, we're, we're, we're making big right? investments. Uh, the, the, the financial part of what you're talking about isn't the issue. The issue is to find the right ones. Um, and, and the way we like doing things is not to throw 100 things up against the wall and see which one's going to be good or not. Um, we, we try to... We hope certainly... Obviously, you want hits and you want things that are very popular. But we want things that are of great quality. And you can see that. Uh, and I hope you'll be able to feel that and see it. Uh, it doesn't mean everything will be a hit, because mm -hmm. you, you don't know that. Uh, but everything should should be very, very high quality. And I think that's where we will stand out. Do you, you also spoke about how Apple does not have a history of huge acquisitions. One reason to not acquire Netflix would be the fact that they're 20 to $25 billion in debt. And that's a lot of debt to take on. Is there... Isn't that a reason not to? Or? A reason not to. Oh, OK, that's sorry. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 conceivably you might think well look twenty twenty five billion dollars we could do that ourselves is 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 would you rather go this alone do you feel like you're smarter than the competition you could do this your own way again I, I don't think it's about being sm smarter I think you know we like doing what we think we know how to do and what we can be great at and we had some ideas on it um, honestly one of the things you also have to realize for yourself for example is we don't know anything about making television. Um, so what skill sets does Apple bring to that um, around it? And the viewpoint is very little. Um, there's other things we bring. We, we know how to create apps. We know how to do distribution, all those kinds of things. We know how to market. But we don't really know how to create shows. And, and so we were cognizant of that. And, and it took us a very long time. I was looking uh, for somebody to head this up for more than two years. 
because what we wanted to find is somebody who really knew the business but was willing to also think of it differently mm -hmm. and, and where we wanted it to go. And, uh, and we were very lucky to hire uh, recently um, two executives um, that joined our company. And now we've got a team. We've hired uh, about 40 people now. Uh, starting internationally now in the last month and a half we've started. And so we're building what I think is a, you know, incredibly talented, capable team of, of creating great quality. Uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg at Wanderco is creating uh, what he calls new TV, and it is focused on, his belief is that where the puck is going is towards content that is two to eight minutes long. Um, not hour-long series, not 30-minute series, but... Do, do you, when you start to think about the future of media and, and what role Apple plays in that, are you thinking about that two to eight minute window as much as you're thinking about shows like the ones you've acquired? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think two to eight minutes is where the puck is going. I think YouTube has, uh, uh, <laughs> has taught us that. I think there's a difference. I think there are things that you only want to see for two or eight minutes, but I don't think you can tell stories um, like Game of Thrones in two to eight minutes. Uh, and I think one of the things that you're seeing is you're seeing tremendous interest in TV series, even over movies at times, because you're able to develop characters, you're able to tell a story in a longer form, and people are really excited about that. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see that as the world is gonna go from 30 hour shows or two hour movies down to two to eight minutes uh, or around it. Again, there, will there be two to eight minute things? There are, you know, I like cars, for example. Eight minute reviews of a car is really great. I don't really want to sit for an hour right. watching, a, <laughs> watching a car review, but eight minutes is great. Right. Uh, let's talk about live TV and sports. What do you guys have planned there? Well, one of the things that we've noticed, I mean, it's, it's easy because I'm a huge sports nut, so it's, it's great when you get to build products for yourself and sometimes you feel like. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things about sports that you, you get, if, if you're a huge sports fan, um, and, and some people won't like me saying this, you don't really care what channel it's on. What you really care about is the game. And so I'm a big Duke fan, so what I care about is I want to watch the Duke game. Um, if it's on ESPN, great. If it's on something else, great too. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do is to make the whole sports viewing experience change. And, and what I mean by that is um, I want to get an alert when the Duke game starts so to remind me that it's there. Uh, if you're a sports fan, for example, uh, and you're a Duke fan, you care about the ACC, which is the conference they play in. And if there's a close game with three or four minutes to go, why am I not getting notified on my device where I could just tap and watch the last three minutes? Every sports fan wants to do that. Um, you know, if you like golf, even if you don't like golf, there was a tremendous amount of interest in Tiger Woods this weekend. Um, you know, the coverage started on TV, I think, on the ninth or 10th hole. Uh, Tiger birdied the first hole on Sunday to get uh, one from the lead. No one got to see it unless you were doing it in an app because, again, the ecosystem changed. And so all of these capabilities are coming in. And so what we try to do is take this TV app as the focal point for people to come in. Um, we've done live news. Uh, we do all of the VOD stuff. But we've taken and created a really in-depth sports piece. And no better time to do that, obviously, than uh, this Thursday with March Madness. How, who's the greatest threat to Duke? <laughs> <laughs> Iona, because that's the first game. Uh, if you know anything, you can about, beat Iona. If can you, you beat Michigan State, and uh, can you beat Kansas? We'll, we'll, you know, as as I always remind people, don't worry about who you're going to face, because you might not be there, or they might not be there. Um, but look, our, our Duke team is capable of beating anybody, uh, as they've shown. Uh, but it's hard to win six games in a row. So, do you do you want? Do you see the, the Apple's relationship with sports as we can provide these, what we do very well, which is the sort of push notification stuff you're talking about? Or do you want to do what Amazon and Facebook are starting to do, which is actually acquire the rights to games and start owning that content yourself? Uh, right now, we, we want to augment the experience. Uh, we think the experience of sports can be so much better. Uh, you want to be able to watch picture in picture. All these technologies. I mean. The, the crazy thing is none of the things I've told, talked about, like a DVR, all these things about finding out the team to follow. You know, the Warriors were playing a game. I'm a huge Warrior fan yesterday. I forgot about it. Um, the game was close. They were playing at Minnesota, and I got a, a message, and then I tapped, and I started watching. I mean, this isn't rocket science. 
the stuff has existed. It's just not been the, ve the vehicles haven't been there. So we think there's a huge opportunity to grow all the things in sports uh, and, and make them more interactive, uh, lots more capability that are there. And we'll do it with Amazon, Amazon Prime, for example, is on the TV app, uh, as well as we'll do it with CBS or ESPN. ESPN's about to launch a new app that, uh, that'll be joining the TV app, which is great. What is the augmented reality experience for sports? Um, well, Five years from now, 10 years from now, sooner? You know, um, I'll tell you the sooner one. Uh, PGA just announced an AR app on AR Kit 1.5 for the iPhone today. Uh, so that's, that's one that's sooner. And what they're trying to do is, is give you a sort of a view of the golf course uh, and the shots that are taking place in, in an AR experience uh, around it. And so what AR lets you do is it lets you see the action in a different way um, than just you know, a two-dimensional view of, of, of a TV. And so, for example, one of the things that you can see, in, since we're talking about the PGA app, um, if you've ever gone to Augusta for the Masters, which is coming up, um, on TV, that looks like a fairly flat place. Um, and it's extremely hilly. Uh, but you don't really see that on TV. You know, in AR, when they're showing the shots, you can actually see the golf course and see all of the different hills. And so you get to experience it in a way that you've never seen before. And, and you can appreciate certain things that you haven't seen before. Are there, are there other, let's talk about augmented reality generally. What, what is Apple's, what's the grand strategy for AR what investments do you hope to make? And, and, and what, what does the experience for an Apple user look like in a world where AR is, is sort of commonplace? Look, one of the problems with technologies like that is that it's hard to sort of build that and start because you start from ground zero, meaning there are no devices, so you gotta sell them all over, and so the, the ramp up curve is, is really hard. Because developers don't want to spend the money until there's enough people, and you, you've got this whole issue back and forth. Is it good enough? And so these technologies tend to start really slowly. One of the things that, that I think we did that was really, really smart is we thought about this years ago as we were building iPhone 6s. And, and we wanted to build AR technology into those phones, even though we didn't have any AR yet. Um, because we knew we were working on it. And what we wanted is when we announced our AR capabilities, we wanted it to work backwards. Um, to the phones that people had. It wasn't just the new phones that you had to buy. And so what that did is last September, um, we announced AR Kit. And if you were a developer, basically you had hundreds of millions of people on iPhones and iPads that, now had ac that you had access to if you were building an AR app. Um, and so what's happened is we've, we've now got over 2,000 AR apps in the store, um, growing at a very fast clip as people are learning about it. And you can reach you know, hundreds of millions of people as opposed to a small set. And so there have been some cool apps. There's a great app that I just saw that was a, uh, you know, one of the difficulties of buying clothes, for example, online, is everybody's body shape is different. And so you look at a shirt and which size is it and how well does it fit. And so you can take an AR thing and have a picture of yourself and, and take the, the image of the clothes and put it on your body and kind of walk around it and see what it looks like and you know, what it shows, doesn't show. Uh, and it's really great and easy to do. And, and it just makes the whole buying experience online that much better if you're, if you're selling clothes. Right. Um, so there's, it changes the dynamics. You look at cars. I just saw something uh, that Porsche is working on where if you want to go buy a car, you do a lot of the research now online. So it used to be you'd go to the dealer, all that. Now you do all the research online. But what's the experience of sitting in the car? What are all of the buttons do? Uh, where are they? What are the controls? How does it look? You can do that right now at home and get the full experience and change the colors, how it's going to feel when you're sitting inside the car, if the car has a black interior versus a tan interior or a white interior. And so all of a sudden, the experience is completely different. Um, and that's not something you can even recreate at the dealership because they don't have every color combi combination there. Right. Um, and so it just really enhances all of the experiences you can do. And so we have the most, we have the most devices that are AR capable in the world today. Do you, are, are, you, are you really bullish on AR as something that just becomes an, sort of in, an integral part of our life? Or do you think there's still going to be some resistance? I mean, there was a moment in which everybody thought VR was the future. And now VR seems like just a huge headache to put on a headset. Uh, look, I... I 
I think AR is, is we are very, very um, optimistic and, and, and think it's going to be huge, and partly because it's not an immersive experience. Um, you know, it's very difficult, uh, for example, for being in this room and all of us being wearing goggles. It kind of would look a little weird. Um, but you raising your phone, uh, Major League Baseball did this, um, you raising your phone, pointing it at, at Dylan here, and having it come up with stats about who Dylan is or how to subscribe to the Pacific, for example, which you just mentioned, um, <laughs> is really, really easy and really fast to do. And it doesn't take away from the experience that we're having here uh, of interacting live. So we think AR is absolutely uh, a very mainstream product and, and something that you're going to use all the time every day. Speaking of which, how long do I have to look down at my phone or hold my phone up? Like when, when, when can we graduate to a, to a point where I'm just wearing something or I'm just seeing things? <laughs> uh, well, I've, you, you know, I've been working at Apple. It'll be 30 years at the end of this year. And so uh, I, I hope to spend another, uh, at least another 20 years there. And so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to answer any questions on future <laughs> products. Uh, <laughs> Well, one of, one of you, you, so you, you probably you probably won't answer this question either. But one of the one of the many companies that gets cited as a possible Apple acquisition target is Magic Leap. Do you feel like the future of AR is wearable technology, or are we still going to be walking around holding up our phones? Well, look uh, again. Um, phones aren't going away uh, for a while, okay. uh, if ever. Uh, around them, having a screen, having the capabilities that you have of, of touch. There, there's a lot of dynamics that the phone is just an incredible device. Uh, and, and it's hard to believe, you know, I just said, been there 30 years. The iPhone is 10 years old. Uh, it's not like we've had it for a lifetime here. <laughs> um, and think of all of the things that it does for you uh, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed and all of the capabilities and, and, and things that it does for your life. And so when you start thinking of what is it that's going to take its place, it has to do all of those things as well or better. And I don't think that's the case in any of the things that we're talking about right. um, around it. So um, it's an incredible device. And there's lots of places where you know um, it doesn't mean that you're not going to want to talk to Siri to the phone, but that doesn't mean that everything is going to be talking. You're not going to have everybody in this room, many of which I can see, or have a phone. They might be looking up and down at it. They're not going to be talking to it. They want to touch it. Um, and so, you know, this is a, an incredible device and has a, a long uh, room, and, and we have a lot of capabilities and things that we're going to keep adding to it, too. So to, to go sort of big picture here for a sec, 10 years ago, since you bring up the iPhone's 10 years old, and for much of the last decade, the sort of enthusiasm around any product launch, iPhone or any tech product launch, um, has been, you know, it's just there's been this sort of celebratory atmosphere. I would say, given everything that's gone on with Facebook and Twitter and Google and fake news and sort of larger discussion about the effect that social media has on, on society, there's also a question about what these devices are doing to us, what the, you know, and... And everything from you know whether or not we are capable of paying attention for more than two seconds at a time to actually like our body structure and our you know my like lumbar structure. Um, do you? I, I know there's a lot of excitement about all the products you work on. Do you worry about the effect that these devices are having on society? Do you worry that maybe you know an eight-year-old kid or a four-year-old kid shouldn't be you know have access to an iPhone? I. I we absolutely do, I, I, and this gets back to how we started this conversation. Um, with big, successful platforms comes great responsibility um, around it. And so this is something we've cared about from the very beginning. So you, you talk about iPhone and, and apps, for example. Um, we did parental controls. Um, we did, uh, we put, each app has an age rating to it. This was something we came up with. Uh, apps didn't have that uh, before. Um, there's no like movie industry to call it PG-13, for example. Um, so we did that. Um, we did it so that a parent could approve every app that a child um, wants to acquire on their phone so that they can click buy, but the parent has to approve it uh, around it. So these are things we've cared about deeply from the very, very beginning. Um, we added a feature uh, 
which some of you hopefully uh, have seen, which is do not disturb. Um, because there are times when you're, you know, if, if you want to do something great and you don't want to be interrupted in the world, um, you turn on the do not disturb and your phone will go silent. Um, you know, we take incredible, one of the things we, we don't want people to do is to uh, text while they're driving. Um, and so we created this driving mode now where when someone texts you, it just responds back saying you're driving and, you know, we'll get back to you and I'll get back to you. So these are all things that we've built right into the products because they're really important to do uh, around them. Now, at the same time, um, it's, we, we need to make sure that the parents have the information and the capabilities and for them to decide. Um, because things aren't always as simple as they look. Not every 10-year-old is the same. Um, not every 14-year-old is the same. And so parents have to decide what, what's the right thing for them. Uh, around it, but that's something we care a lot about our, in, in our platforms. Do you do you have immense influence? Do you fear regulation? Um, look, I, I think our company is different. Um, we're different not, than different than what you're what you're talking about. We don't. First of all, we're we're our customers' privacy is of utmost importance to us. We're not collecting a ton of information about you what you do, where you are, et cetera, around it. We're really not interested in it um, in, in most cases. Uh, and when we do, it's very, we keep the minimal amount that we need in order to do exactly what we're telling you that we're going to do with it. Um, we don't make our money off of advertising. Um, so we're not trying to, again, find out where you're shopping, what you buy, what you don't buy, all of that standpoint. It's not what we do. So a lot of the regulations that you're seeing kind of goes to both of those, those issues. Um, and so I think we're in a better position because our businesses aren't in that. Our, our businesses, you love our products, you pay for them, you buy them, and then we give you that, that product. We don't, we don't try to collect money you, from, from it on an ongoing basis. Do you think Facebook and Google are irresponsible in their data collection of their users? <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, it's, again, it's always difficult to answer the question about somebody else because you're not there, you don't know exactly what they are or aren't, aren't doing around it. Um, and so I, I don't want to answer, I, I don't want to say what they are or not doing or whether they're irresponsible. I think we focus on what we're doing and communicating it to the customer and hopefully letting the customer decide whether we're doing it right or not. And, and I think that's worked really well for us. Okay. Uh, if you look over the last 10 years, when we started talking about privacy and security and all these things, they weren't top of mind. Um, and in a way, most people, well, who cares? It wasn't that important. But now people realize the importance of it and, and what the ramifications of it are. And I think that's, you can see the feedback that we get from our customers. It's, it's been very, very positive. So, okay, let's pull back now and go even bigger picture. Set aside everything you're working on at Apple. Let's just talk about society. Let's talk about human beings' well-being. What do you, what do you see in, in the field of technology? What do you see as the greatest opportunity and the greatest challenge over the course of the next 10 to 15 years? Well, look, I, technology uh, is a great thing and makes uh, human beings more capable. Uh, but technology in, in and of itself is not for good. The, the people that make the technology have to make it for good. <laughs> um, so you can't confuse one with the other. And so um, when we look at technology, and I, I think I was making a comment to you earlier today, we were talking, when I went to school, I couldn't bring a calculator into class um, throughout my, even my high school, because if I brought a calculator into class, it would, I, I wouldn't know how to add, multiply, and all these other things around it. Turns out that's not really true. You learn the basics. And, and learning how to multiply 342 million blah, blah, blah times 242 million, doing it by hand versus the calculator doesn't really matter. And so my daughter, who's now 16 and in high school, has had a calculator since she's in third grade. And she's a hell of a lot more advanced than I am. And so technology, the, the great thing, I mean, I, I envy the fact that I'm not 16 years old and able to have all of this technology available to me. You can change the world now. When I was a kid, you, you could barely you know, see outside of the place you lived. Mm -hmm. Now you know everything that's going on in the world. You, could, you, know, you build an app, you can release it across the world. So I think the, the positives and the opportunities are, are huge 
uh, with that. And uh, we need companies um, to do great things with that technology. Do you think the, the current sort of what, what's known as the tech lash, the sort of noise out there, concerns about the influence that tech is having on us, are, do you feel like those are overstated? Do you feel like those get in the way of what is ultimately a net benefit? Well, I, don't think, I don't think anything's overstated. I think when there are issues, they need to be stated and they need to be corrected. Yeah. Um, and so these are legitimate issues and legitimate problems. I don't, you know, we read a lot about fake news. That's a problem. Uh, you you got you to figure out how to fix those problems. And so uh, it is worthwhile to talk about it. That doesn't mean technology is bad. Uh, and so you can't, it's not that black and white. What is the greatest challenge for Apple as a business over the next 10 years? Look, our challenge is it doesn't change. It didn't change 10 years ago, and it's not going to change 10 years from now. Uh, our number one goal is to build the best products in the world um, that either change, enhance, make your life better. And we still think there's a huge opportunity in that. And so we care deeply. We don't want to build a lot of things. We're going to build a few things, but things that hopefully make your life better. Um, and it happens... Some things are simple, by the way. I'll give you an example today. I went to the hotel. I went to breakfast. I went back to my room to grab my bag. My key doesn't work because it's one of those magnetic keys, so now you've got to go back down to the lobby. There's somebody waiting. And blah, blah, blah. It's like, who needs a key, right? Um, why can't I just open my phone? Why can't I open the door of my phone when I'm there? It knows it's me, and the W Hotel is doing that, for example. So that's a very simple problem, obviously, but nonetheless an annoying problem. And so that's one example to the other extreme of where our technology is, is helping, you know, what we're doing in health, for example, uh, where people have irregular heart rhythms. Uh, and if you have an irregular heart rhythm, you don't know. Um, and of course, when you go to the doctor, you know, it never shows there. Uh, and you don't really know, but you're in a resting state like I am here, and your heart rate is, is really elevating. You have that problem. It's a leading cause um, uh, lots of, of, of medical issues associated with it. And with the watch on, we can tell. And so we're doing a great study with Stanford uh, where patients are being monitored, or not patients, but customers, and hopefully not patients. Uh, and, and we're you know, finding out about it, and there's a hotline they call, and they go straight to the doctor uh, to be able to determine. I mean, that... That, by the way, if you want to do things like for to save medical costs, which is a big problem, that's a great example of something. If you could do something proactive as opposed to after the fact, uh, it, one, saves a ton of lives, saves a ton of, of medical hardship and issues uh, by doing those kinds of things. So when, when people ask me the question about the challenges and opportunities of the next decade, to me the most exciting space is healthcare and artificial intelligence. Do you what what are the ambitions for Apple in the healthcare space? Would you you know Amazon is trying to get in on on various aspects of of uh, uh, you know medical supplies, medical services. Do, would you like to see you know every doctor wearing an Apple Watch? Would you like? I mean, what, what's the what's Apple's play in healthcare? Well, we'd like to use the technologies to make you healthier, um, and that relates to. The apps today of you know filling the ring by exercising, uh, which we know makes you healthier, um, to something like the heart rate and, and being able to monitor, um, and those are all things that are important. Um, health records we just announced um, that you can have your health record. One of the problems when you go to medicine is your health records live in all of these different places and they never live in a single place. What if you could have all your health records on your phone, um, so when you went to a doctor or a specialist, um, they could see that. Um, so we think there's a huge, huge opportunity, and we'd like to use our, our technologies and our capabilities to enhance that. As I said, one of the ways that we were, it goes to filling the rings, it goes to the, you know, the heart rate, is to try to do it proactively uh, and do it before the fact. If we can get people you know, living healthier lives, um, it's better for everything, mm -hmm. uh, most importantly for themselves. Right. Um, so that, that's, that's how we try to think of it. Let's talk about the, what was formerly the core product of Apple, which is music. Spotify is going public. Do you wish that you had sort of nipped Spotify in the bud several years ago? I mean, they do have, they, they do have sort of crazy subscriber 
uh, bass. I think it's something like double what you guys have at Apple Music. Yeah, it's, it's look, we have 38 million subscribers and, and we don't talk about our trials and these are people that have given us a payment method and, and that's the we have over 8 million trials. So it's, I don't know how quite the numbers work, but it's, that's really not that important. Um, because, when, important. because when you look at the number of subscribers that Spotify and us have together um, and you look at the number of people that are listening to music around the world, or even something as simple as the number of people that come to visit our app store every week. We have a half a billion people that visit our app store every week. Um, and now you're talking about just north of 100 million music subs. We're like this big mm -hmm. in, the, in the scheme of things. And so the real opportunity for music, and, and this doesn't, it's not about Spotify or us or, or the labels, it's about artists. Um, is how do they get their music to everyone around the world and, and how do they get compensated for that? And, and that's what we're trying to do. And, and, but we've, we both um, have to grow by significant amounts in order to get to the numbers um, in which it should. Everybody in this room likes music. Mm -hmm. Everybody in this room listens to music. Maybe different music. What do you listen to? Uh, <laughs> you know... Look, I, when you have a 16-year-old daughter, you get to, it's a great advantage because you listen to a lot of pop and a lot of new songs or whatever. But um, one of the, the things that I've been listening to recently, which most of you may not have heard of, is a, is a person by the name of Ludovico Dinaudi. Um, and he's a classical piano musician. I'm not a classical person. But this person, he actually plays the piano, but he has a full orchestra behind him. And so it's like, you know, it really trying to take classical in a way with new music, and he's just incredible. And so I've become a huge fan over the last like six months. See, I was hoping you were gonna say Kendrick Lamar. That was it. Well, or Rihanna, which everyone's listening to if you saw her stats. Yeah, Rihanna, why did she, she just pass some milestone on Apple Music? She did, she had uh, uh, over uh, two million um, um, streams um, in, on, on Apple Music, so the, it, first, the first artist to do that. The, the thing that separates music from television is that if you, are, if you are Netflix or Disney or whoever, you can go and you can buy specific premium content that is exclusive to yourself. Fundamentally, at the end of the day, you, Amazon, YouTube, Spotify, you guys are all offering the same thing in terms of the actual content. The only question is, um, how, what, what is the interface like for the user? Yeah, what's the experience? And then, and then also scale, and at a certain point it seems to me, if, if you've got iPhones going out all over the world and Amazon has a, you know, Alexa going out all over the world, then Spotify's actually screwed because they don't have the built-in <laughs> hardware to... Look, I, again, I, I think they're doing just fine, and uh, the, the, the opportunity here is, is about growth for us and for everybody else. Um, there's legitimately, there's probably easily, you know, two billion people that can afford or can pay for some level of music, and we have a hundred million, so there's there's a big gap in there. Before we move on to to the last thing I want to talk about, which is really the only thing I wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> what, <laughs> what is uh, is there any is, is there anything? coming up at Apple, anything that's next, anything that you are looking forward to in terms of, of where all this technology and innovation is going that you're excited about that we haven't talked about? Yes. Tell me. <laughs> Tell us. Uh, look, we, we better, uh, because that's what, we, that's what we do for a living. And so uh, we're... we're what, hap what happens when you launch a product and it doesn't go as well? Like, you have such a history of launching products that everybody goes crazy about. What happens when you launch a product and it doesn't, like the HomePod didn't sell quite as well as I think you were anticipating? No, we're, look, we're actually, we're, we're very pleased with the HomePod. It's a new category uh, of product and um, we think it's, a, it, it's by far the best sounding speaker uh, on the planet uh, available today. Uh, it's this, it is the best uh, musicologist that there is. In other words, musicologist is does it, does knowledge about music. Uh, so that you can be playing Born to Run and ask it who the drummer is and it'll tell you who that is or when the song was released so it knows more about music than anything. But ultimately your question is, look, we, we, don't, we don't build 100 products. Right. Um, and so we put all of our energies behind a few things 
And the reason we do that is because in order, at least for us, in order to do something great, we just don't know how to do that a hundred times over. Um, and so we've got to put all of our energies behind a few things to make them great. And so we bet everything on those products. Uh, and so we don't have seven others that do the same kind of thing in a different way or whatever. Uh, and mainly because we don't know how to do that. We, we don't know how to make seven great products of the same thing. Um, and so, but that allows, the, one of the things that I've, I've been at Apple for a long time and, and Apple changed over those years. And, and one of the great things that Apple does today and, and has been doing, and I think it's one of the reasons that we've had a lot of success, is that focus on, and that focus is about saying no. It's not about saying yes. It's actually very easy to say yes to everything. It's really, really hard to say no. Um, and so we're very, very focused. And, and that allows the whole company to get behind these products um, to hopefully do something that's great. What was the biggest thing you said no to in the last two years? <laughs> uh, there's, there's a million things we've said no to. Um, because, again, there's always good ideas and, and, and some bad ideas and all of that standpoint that you go through the cycle of. Um, but at the end of the day, you just, there's, you got to focus on what's really, really important. Um, and, and what do you think really, as we talked about, it's, it's sort of the, we can talk about the puck. It's the same thing as you got to be able to see around the corner. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite lines of all is if I, if you go to this room and you ask them, you know, how do they make, how do you, how should we make the iPhone better? I'm sure we would have lots of people that had ideas about what we should do next. Um, and some of them, you know, are the right things and probably the ones we're going to do. But if you want to go around the corner, you can't ask people. And it's, it's the quote that Henry Ford did, which is, if, if you went to customers at that time and you asked them, if you're Henry Ford and you're doing market research, and you ask them what do they want, they would tell you they want a faster horse. They're not going to tell you they want a car. Mm -hmm. And so you, you kind of have to be able to, to think around the corner. Do you know what's around the corner? I, I hope we do. <laughs> You're not going to tell us. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, so we have about five minutes left. This is what I wanted to talk to you about. Are the Golden State Warriors going to win the NBA championship? <laughs> <laughs> well, since we're close to Houston, I'm sure many people in this room didn't want. You know, look, it's... it's uh, the reason he's asked, I'm a big, as you saw, a big basketball fan. And so I go to a lot of Warrior games. Um, I don't know. I hope so. Um, it's who is, hard. Who is the greatest threat to it's the Warriors? It is hard to win. Uh, when you go to championships um, three years in a row, it's hard to stay focused. Remember, I just started with the whole thing about staying focused. Um, and so it's hard to stay focused. And you can see the team today is, is not doing as well. The biggest threat, who knows? Look, Houston's the biggest threat if you look at it by record. Um, to me personally, the biggest threat is the Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, I think they're, they match up very well with us. And, uh, and they want to beat us pretty badly since KD came to the Warriors. Does the fact that Rihanna just passed that milestone on... Um Apple Music has that has that mended fences between you guys after your little blow up on the court. <laughs> no, we've we've always uh, I have uh, great admiration for her. She's an amazing artist, and uh, and I'm a huge fan of her song. So uh, now she's not. I don't think she's a Warrior fan, but not everyone can. <laughs> Tough be. luck, uh, guys. I want to thank you so much for coming out. I hope I hope this was illuminating and enlightening. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie, thank for you. taking the time to do this. Really appreciate it. Thanks.